somehow when we start to cut, price, cut costs in order to be price competitive against mass merchandisers, uh, against big box stores and the like, all of a sudden part of what makes us a pharmacy, part of what makes us special, part of what makes communities want us to be there, somehow it gets lost in the translation. Now, it doesn't have to be this way, of course. There are other ways of reducing costs, right? It's, it's the classic economist's idea. We are going to substitute, we're going to substitute capital for labor. We're going to put machines in instead of people. Why? Well, because machines don't get sick. Machines don't form unions. Machines don't gripe. Machines always do the right thing. Machines work the same way every time. Machine doesn't work, what do you do? Well, you kick it. You can't do that to people anymore. And in fact, if you look at the economics of automation, you can understand why things like automated dispensing machines, dispensing systems, are, are gaining such great traction in certain parts of the country. Because if you look at what it, t what it costs a company, what it costs a store to, to put automation in, well, every time we increase their fixed costs, the element of profitability that goes up when we automate things, when we use more information technology, our profit only decreases by 2.3%. And if you do that math, you come to a conclusion like this. If I can find a way if I can increase my fixed cost by, let's say, 3%, my profit would fall by 6.9%. But if in the process of increasing that automation, I could reduce my variable cost by 1%, I would actually come out almost an entire percent more profitable, wouldn't I? And again, you can start to understand why especially big box stores, chain stores, want to automate everything in sight. You start to understand why we go through now and we see these automated checkout counters. I mean, next thing you know, they'll be firing an RFID chip into our arms so they can automatically bill us at the end of the day. Is it a good thing to do? Let's find out. Welcome to Queen's University. Want to speak to somebody in the School of Business? Press 1. Faculty of Arts and Science? Press 2. Engineering? Press 3. Law? Press 4. Want to hear more choices? Press 5. Want to hear the list again? Press 6. Welcome to the School of Business. Want to speak to somebody in Marketing? Press 1. Human Resources? Press 2. Operations? Press 3. Accounting? Well, we suggest you get a life. Tell me something, you're, you're mature decision makers. What do you do when you encounter that automated receptionist? Who said press? You said press zero, sir? What, what, what is your name, sir? David. David. You know, David, we, we have a name for people like you. You know what we call them, David? We call them margin sucking maggots. Well, I'm sorry, but you know, the, the nerve of this man, right? I, I go to all of this expense to put in this automated receptionist. Why? So I can fire the human operator, make a little more money. I do that. What does he do? He comes online. He hits zero. Now I'm stuck with the automated receptionist, and I got to go back, you know, tail between my legs and rehire the human operator. Why? Because he doesn't want to deal with the machine. He's special. He doesn't know who he wants to talk. It's all about you, David, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you know, when David's the customer, it is all about David. It is all about doing whatever it takes to make David feel comfortable enough to leave some portion of his wealth with me. All right? And in that context, what we tend to see happen so often in this environment is we depersonalize the relationship with the customer. And with that depersonalization comes a, a, a more terrible and a much more tragic consequence, the loss of customer loyalty. You see, the research on this is very clear. People are not loyal to companies. People are not loyal to buildings. They're not loyal to institutions. And they're certainly not loyal to technology. People are loyal to the people behind those buildings, the people behind those institutions, the people behind those, those, those systems. 
And when we sever that relationship in pursuit of low cost, we make it impossible, impossible then to justify the relationship. I can do business with a friend. I can show preference for doing business with a friend. I can't show preference for a chair or a wall or a piece of furniture. The degradation, the depersonalization of our relationship is a terrible, terrible thing. Now, if you're looking at all of this, you're saying, well, that's fine, Ken, but let's remember the initial point, which was a trade-off, right? I'm prepared to reduce my price because even though I may make a little bit less margin, as long as I'm making that lower margin on more units, I'm, I'm richer, I'm better off. It's a trade-off, surely, I would make in a heartbeat if I could. The problem we have is this. For the average North American business, every time I increase my volume by 1%, by acquiring a new account, by acquiring a new customer, I only get a 3.3% lift in profitability. And if you do that math, what it tells you is this. If the, pursuit, if, you're, if the pursuit of new business causes you to drop price, every time you reduce your price by 1%, you need to increase your volume by about 3.4% just to stay even with where you started. Just to stay even with where you started. Want to give your customer a 10% off coupon? Go for it, by all means. But please be certain that that 10% coupon will generate a 34% increase in volume. If not, you've just given away profitability at the same time that you gave away price. And I cannot think of too many categories of products, with the possible exception of retail gas, where we would see that level of price sensitivity. 